In 2011, the fourth story expansion of Fallout New Vegas, Lonesome Road, was released and introduced one of the most ambitious characters in the series. Ulysses, the antagonist of Lonesome Road, was always hinted to throughout the main game and the three other story expansions, building an air of mystery around who this character was. You hear one of the early indications of Ulysses by this character called Johnson Nash who runs the Mojave Express, the company the player character worked at. It turns out the package you were supposed to deliver at the New Vegas Strip that almost resulted in your death, this other courier turned it down simply because he recognized your name. No, let Courier 6 carry the package, that's what he said. Like the Mojave'd sort you out or something. Then he just up and walked out. Sounds like you two had a history for him to act like that. And turn down the money too. Hope he didn't see any trouble in that package of yours. Maybe he thought your name was bad luck. Enough for me to say. Lonesome Road takes place in a hellish land called the Divide, an old world town that was torn apart by nuclear warheads and underground silos. But this place was destroyed long after the Great War brought civilization to an end. The destiny of Courier 6 lies at the heart of the Divide to uncover the mystery of their role and learn what is at stake in the world, learn why Ulysses sees the world as he does. Our journey begins with the Twisted Hairs tribe Ulysses was a part of. In the early days of Caesar's Legion, they both formed an alliance to invade Arizona. Once Caesar's conquest was secured, he betrayed the Twisted Hairs and assimilated them into his legion. The tribals who fought back were crucified as a demonstration of the legion's cruelty. Wolpus and Cota, the leader of the Frumentari, oversaw the pacification of Ulysses' tribe in Drywells and the obliteration of their history. Ulysses was traumatized by what he saw. He witnessed true evil in the callous eyes of Wolpus, the immense cruelty humans conflict upon other humans. He would have deserted the Legion had he not been loyal to Caesar and the regime. During his time in the Legion, he was one of the most resourceful Fumentaris and became a courier to blend in. Under oath, he was ordered by Caesar to kill no other courier as many were, in fact, Legion spies. In 2274, things in Ulysses' life started to change, especially around his beliefs. He was the first among the Legion to witness the Hoover Dam and the New California Republic. The NCR were a force for the first time that could challenge the might of Caesar's Legion. When he returned to Caesar to inform him of the threat the NCR posed, Caesar became obsessed with the Hoover Dam. The Legion were built around conquest and domination, and the Hoover Dam was that ideal pursuit. The dam was a monument in Ulysses' eyes fought for power, a symbol of what the old world was like. War, control, domination, cruelty, the defining traits of the world before the Great War. The world had simply not moved on from barbarism. Caesar was determined at any cost to claim victory at the Hoover Dam, he was unwilling to let it go. Failure even was not going to be tolerated. Ulysses was there when Joshua Graham, the former leading commander of the whole legion, returned defeated and was banished into the Grand Canyon. Ulysses believed the dam was going to lead Caesar and his legion to their death, whether they lost or won. Conquest and war is the only thing the Legion believes in, it is their only purpose. What this leads to is an unsustainable society that must always be ready to march to war, to march soldiers to their deaths, and must always be victorious. Failure can never be accepted, companionship must be rejected, acceptance of difference is believed to lead to the degeneration of society. Their core principle is perpetual violence with no end in sight. Ulysses came to understand that the Legion, furthermore fascism, is a dead end. Even at this stage though, he remained at Caesar's side for he had no other cause to cling to, yet. 
A couple of years afterward, Ulysses heard of Courier 6. The courier travelled all over, walked the same paths as Ulysses and kept returning to the Divide. He followed them and found what was inside that place. It was a community and not any community he had seen before. What he saw drastically changed everything for him, shattered his perspective of what was possible for a society to be. The name it had, the Divide, never originally referred to the crack in the earth it's known for. The Divide meant the divide between West and East. The community was a supply line and was able to link both places. Yet it was more than that. Ulysses saw it as a new beginning for America, a nation in the making. Likely in his early time in the Legion, Ulysses bought into the indoctrination of the NCRZ degenerate society and stood against the Son of Mars' rightful conquest of the Earth. His views on them changed, they became more grounded and rational. Ulysses understood the NCR were emulating the old world, old America, the systems and beliefs of that time period. Old America, including the rest of the world, were in turmoil and conflict, fighting each other for the last remaining resources on the planets. It was a nuclear age with wondrous technology only imagined in science fiction. I mean, Fallout is science fiction, so we're still imagining it. Where am I going with this joke? Due to some events in history not taking place, the Soviet Union never collapsed and actually had ties and were even friends with America. So we can definitely tell this is a work of fiction. The world came to an abrupt stop once they realized the resources they primarily used, petroleum and uranium, were drying up. Instead of adapting, wars broke out, invasions to steal resources occurred, the long 25 year resource wars had begun. So you might be asking how this relates to the NCR, why would Ulysses even be worried about the possible threat the NCR poses to the world? It all comes down to what the NCR are emulating, what lessons they learned and didn't learn about the old world. Old America and most parts of the world, except for maybe the Soviet Union and China, followed neoliberal capitalist ideals. For starters, what is neoliberalism? Liberalism is an ideology based on freedom and justice. Neoliberals, following the tenets of liberalism, believe capitalism provides utmost freedom for individuals with little government interference, a laissez-faire capitalist society. What this leads to is minimal government interference and a competitive market. What this created in the world of Fallout, and the real world, <coughs> is a structure for incredibly wealthy individuals to take hold and influence social and political life. An oligarchy was formed and you can say were a dictatorship that can bend the government to follow their class interests. The oligarchy is largely responsible for not advancing the world to more renewable fuel. Many of them were in charge of the corporations supplying petroleum and uranium. They had control of society and they were unwilling to let go of their position of power. But since the world relied heavily on resources to continue functioning, imperialism was an inevitable process. Imperialism was born when the ruling class in capitalist production came up against national limitations to its economic expansion. The bourgeoisie turned to politics out of economic necessity. For, if it did not want to give up the capitalist system, whose inherent law is constant economic growth, it had to impose this law upon its home government and to proclaim expansion to be an ultimate political goal of foreign policy. The NCR has the same problem, or at least the beginnings of it. Brahmin barons, cattle landowners, hold political influence in the Republic. They were held in check by President Tandy by pushing regulations of how much cattle and land they can own. This was overturned by President Aaron Kimball, effectively creating a ruling class in the Republic. Neoliberalism is creeping its way back in the post-apocalyptic society. That whole utmost freedom for individuals with little government interference, well, it's only for a few individuals, the rest of the people have to slave away for a pittance. There is another layer of old America and its unwilling stance to change. Imperialism was an inevitable consequence, but yet not even this could last forever. Most people would get fed up with it. So America and the West changed. It abandoned its liberal ideals for full-blown fascism. 
America became nationalistic, deeply xenophobic, all to have the populace distracted with fighting each other instead of overthrowing the oligarchy. Propaganda was rampant, communism was viewed as a totalitarian philosophy and deeply un-American. Yet America became totalitarian, trade unions were attacked, Chinese Americans were sent to concentration camps. While the Chinese Communist Party was also totalitarian and attacked the US first, the concept of communism was not the threat that posed to take away the freedom of Americans. The point was to distract people from becoming class conscious of their own exploitation. Any talk of changing their dire situation, advocating for socialism, giving power back to the people, was sidestepped to keep the wealthy in power. By 2077, it was too late to turn the clocks back, the Great War finally occurred. The oligarchs who predicted the end of the world fled to the oil rig, which became the Enclave headquarters. Mr. House fortified Las Vegas to destroy nuclear warheads and abandoned everyone to die. What the NCR is doing is laying out for history to repeat itself. The NCR and Legion discovered the divide and fought for it. Ulysses saw the potential in this community, something greater than the bear and bull, to move beyond petty conflict and unite the world to something better. He tried to save it, but it was too late. The Courier delivered a package of doom to the NCR, a device of enclave technology to destroy the divide and prevent the Legion from taking over. Unlaunched nukes were detonated underground and tore the earth apart, killing all the inhabitants, almost all. Ulysses' life was spared that fateful day. Medical eyebots were activated and discovered his dying body. He believed the symbol of America, the flag of the Commonwealth, reminded the eyebots of their service to a world that exists no more. Scarred, but alive, his hope of seeing something truly great, a nation taking its first breath, a place he could call home, was snuffed away. His journey didn't end there. What he saw, the hope of a new nation, was capable of being destroyed by the acts of a single individual. He believed individuals can change the course of history, or erase it. He understood what was at stake in the world, and that he at least could try to change it. He returned to Caesar. Wait, why did I say it like that? He returned to Caesar after the Legion's defeat in the first battle of Hoover Dam, and was given a new assignment. Caesar knew Joshua Graham was alive. He refused to admit it because it would show to his tribe he was capable of making mistakes and ordered Ulysses to train the White Legs to destroy the new Canaans, Graham's family. Just like all the other tribes, as Ulysses knew firsthand, they were being deceived and would be assimilated into the Legion. White Legs. They were born for war. They run to it, hungry for battle. Yet their hunger is to be part of history, something larger. Like the Legion, as always, brought them a message from Kaiser. If New Canaan burns, Kaiser might see them. Might. Even the chance was a lie. To honor Kaiser, destroy the history of New Canaan and the way they carry it in their generations and family. Kaiser respects a such strength, I told them. That, that was truth. Even if strength wasn't the word. Obedience. You must be willing to kill anyone. Children, mothers, the weak, elders. If these new Canaanites value the generations, that is what you must kill. It was like Wolpis was speaking through me. Use the night, silence, and fire to change their words to please, to screams. No need for bombs when hate will do. I ask the White Legs to destroy a people with ancestry going back thousands of years. Another death of history lost to time. The new Canaanites, they supplied medicine, food traded with others, civilization, a hand from the past, not history, but maybe a past deeper. Farther than that to a place where this God really exists. If so, 
his handiwork and people belong elsewhere, not in this place. Another symbol like bear and bull with no meaning in the present. The white legs meant to show respect, bribe me for Kaiser's favor, echoing mannerisms and words, showed them tech gashes, taught them the workings of chamber and powder, spoke of Kaiser's pride in those that used such things, lies, and, and then, they tried to honor me, not the Legion. They brought me before the campfire one night, showed me how they changed themselves, how they wore their hair now. It was like my entire dead tribe in the firelight, teeth grinning red in the dark, eager corpses, blood-covered ghosts. They had taken my braids, the way of the twisted hairs, as if it showed they were like me, of me, while every knot in their braids spoke of raping, violence, and ignorance of what the knots meant. They thought to show respect, defiled it, lost myself in trying to read the braids they wove, when I remembered they had put no meaning in it. They had no history of what it meant. They didn't even know the insult and the twists, knots. And dry wells came rushing back. The white legs circled like that. It was like looking at the dead of my tribe, reborn as ghosts, hateful, hungry, bowing to Kaisar. Another history. After Yule Caesar's role in the destruction of New Canaan, his service to Caesar was over. Seeing the mockery of his dead tribe in the White Legs was the final push that caused him to leave. His purpose changed. He understood someone like the Courier was capable of changing the course of history. So that was what he planned to do. He collected his thoughts at his home at Wolfhorn Ranch, walked the race to find the best course to lead humanity to a better future. The Legion and NCR were already tried and failed societies proven by similar societies of the past. They had no long-term goals, were bent on control and dominance. Mr. House represented something else as well. He was a billionaire who only ever pursued profit and selfishly saved himself and let the world burn. He has no ideal solution to move humanity forward. New Vegas is the same society before 2077, a symbol of greed and exploitation. Mr. House cares for himself only and will let everyone die again if it meant to save his money-making machine of New Vegas. The solutions for humanity were scarce, but Ulysses persisted. He refused to give up. Eventually, he discovered the secret hidden base of Big Mountain. I guess you can say it was no longer a secret then. A scientific facility that once served the United States government during the Cyano-American Resource War. He hoped it had the answers in what he could do. Inside, he found two Brotherhood members trying to kill each other. Father Elijah, former elder of the BOS, was searching for weapons to destroy the NCR and make the Brotherhood the dominant superpower in the wastes again. A little symbolic between him and Ulysses, searching through the past to find the answers they needed. The other Brotherhood member, Christine Royce, was ordered to assassinate Elijah for his desertion and relentless murder spree, but was knocked out and sent to a facility to be lobotomized. Ulysses saved her and brought her to a cave to heal up, there he learned much about the Brotherhood, hoping they would be his hope for humanity. It wasn't meant to be. Another dead end. They were too dogmatic, craved for power, and isolated themselves from the rest of the world. Elijah is obsessed. He's mad. It's why they ordered his execution. Two are more alike than you know. Too wrapped up in the wrong bits of history to see ahead. Not judging. I know how it is. People are like couriers. You and him sometimes don't even know the message they bring. You all had a new flag. Thought maybe new ideas along with it. What you believe 
isn't any better than the bear or bull. No future in either. So says the man with the old world flag on his back. America, the Commonwealth, burned away. America sleeps. And until it's dead, I carry it. Just like I carried you. More than hope. Belief. Ulysses is an ideologue. He is uncompromising, though a little dogmatic. I'll get into that in a little bit. In this stage of his life, he was willing to take drastic measures to achieve what he needed. He lived outside of civilization, lived as a tribal, brought into a barbaric tribe. The events in his life taught him that extreme measures had to be taken. But he needed answers. He was directionless. The think tanks of the Big Empty had those answers. What he didn't expect was how insane the old scientists had become. Dr. Mobius, one of the scientists, lobotomized the think tanks to stop their maddening pursuit to experiment on everything. Their obsession of furthering scientific research was sinister, creating monsters and experimenting on human subjects. They lost who they were, lost their own humanity. They carried on with the same goals they always had in the Big Empty, stuck in a recurring loop, stuck in the past. Have you ever wanted to speak to history, just to know the why of it? I don't. Not any longer. There's old stories about gods and men, past history into myth. For the gods, they're like children, petulant, cruel. Those were the voices of the big empty. The past couldn't leave well enough alone. Had to ask. Had to ask the why of it. Their answers were madness and power stronger than me. Would take a hundred Elijahs, someone tougher than him or I, to best of them in their dome. They didn't know why they were there, what had led to that point. Their names, like serpents devouring themselves, cannibalizing their own thoughts. When all seemed lost, thought it was the end. My anger gave me strength to ask them my last question. Who are you? I do not know what your history. And they awoke. For a short time. The flag you wear, they said. We remember. America. It wasn't just a flag to them. It was a place. An idea they had cared for. Once. They told me what it was like to grow in that world. All they had done to lift it up. Protect it. They didn't know it was gone. That, yet, they had cared once, before forgetting their history. As they were talking, kept seeing the career's shadow behind them, giving each their words weight. History cast aside, a home left behind. I listened, I asked, was there anything left? Anything that still carries America's voice. And they told me I had already been there. I and one other, walking right out of history deeper than we knew. They told me what lies in the heart of the divide, what can be found there, and the words to awaken it, and the one to speak them. It all culminates to this. The courier receives a message from Ulysses to go back home and learn what they had done. Ulysses explains their history, their connection. He leads them to the silo at the heart of the Divide, one of the few that didn't detonate. At the edge of the world, Ulysses is confronted by the courier. Ulysses had come to the conclusion that the NCR must be destroyed. There is no hope for the Republic, rotted with disease of the old world. He wants to bring ruin to a nation just like the Courier did to the Divide, watch something great die by his hands. It is madness, but he believes there is no other choice. He does this because he cared for the idea of hope that the Divide once brought. 
If you collect all of his tapes scattered throughout the Divide, you can use what he learned and didn't learn. Show him that he came close to a different perspective. Who are you that do not know your history? Changing the symbol instead of destroying what it is or represents, that is something else entirely. <laughs> no need to destroy the bear. Just cut its throat. You taught me that at the Divide. Only need to cut off the supply line, the road to watch something greater die. I'll turn the long 15 into miles of fire. Cut off the Mojave. NCR will fall back, lose Hoover Dam, and leave their throats exposed to the Legion. Your actions have carried strength. If you speak for the two-headed bear, I'll hear your words, even if I will be the only one to hear them. If you believe it should not die this day, then answer me why. Comes down to perspective, how far one's walked, and what they've left behind. If you challenge this moment, let's hear your perspective. If my words are all you have, let's hear them. That question, either you walk the big empty, you found the last of the hollow tapes. The words are mine, whatever answer you think they hold. You're wrong. It was a question. Nothing more. I spoke those words in anger. I did not expect an answer. All was lost. I thought it was the end. Past their graves of failed technology. They had cared about the flag they had followed, and the people beneath it, even with them dead and gone. But there's no answer in that. I do this because I care, because I believe it must be done. still stands against us. Our enemies gather outside, shadows of the bear and a bull. They will have found their way in, just as you did. It was always my intention. In case I could not kill you, the marked men would flood this place, cut off your escape. If we cannot prevent what comes, then let us make our stand here. Two couriers together at the Divide. 
While there are many outcomes at the end of Lonesome Road, I thought this choice was the most fitting. Having both couriers fighting against a horde of marked men feels just an awesome climax to the end of the story, but there are a few things I want to cover before this video ends. Firstly, what exactly made Ulysses believe the Divide was something special? I may have listed off problems of Old America, NCR, The Legion, and Mr. House, but we don't have much to go off of what the Divide was. He believed it was greater than both NCR and Legion. When we take a look at NCR and Legion, including the Old World, what we see are societies based on exploitation and violence. There are different layers to their exploitation and violence. NCR is neoliberal, Legion is fascist, the Old World was also neoliberal that evolved into fascism. So what can we speculate about the Divide? Writing the script, I was reading The Conquest of Bread because I thought Ulysses was an anarchist. Turns out he isn't. He isn't based. But laid out in the book is an idea of what a better society could look like, one without exploitation and coercion. It could be structured around cooperation, mutual aid, and be able to satisfy our basic material needs without selling your labour to someone of a higher class than you. Ulysses says the courier was the one who helped the divide re-establish with the wasteland. He believes couriers keep communities alive. It's quite possible the divide worked on cooperation and the courier did it due to wanting to improve the conditions and lives of everyone in the community. The ideas in the bread book show how society can be better and be able to satisfy our needs more effectively through cooperation. The means of production being the collective work of humanity, the product should be the collective property of the race. Individual appropriation is neither just nor serviceable. All belongs to all. All things are for all men, since all men have need of them, since all men have worked in a measure of the strength to produce them, and since it's not possible to evaluate everyone's part in the production of the world's wealth. All things are for all. Here is an immense stock of tools and implements. Here are all those iron slaves, which we call machines, which saw and plane, spin and weave for us, unmaking and remaking, working up raw matter to produce the marvels of our time. But nobody has the right to seize a single one of these machines and say, this is mine. If you want to use it, you must pay me a tax on each of your products. Any more than if you, the lord of medieval times, had the right to say to the peasant, this hill, this meadow belong to me and you must pay me a tax on every sheaf of corn you reap, on every rick you build. All is for all. If the man and the woman bear their share fair of work, they have a right to their fair share of all that is produced by all, and that share is enough to secure them well-being. No more of such vague formulas as the right to work, or to each the whole result of his labor. What we proclaim is the right to well-being. Well-being for all. While it's a profounding book, there is something else. We cannot give up trying to make the world a better place. Ulysses in the story gave up on the NCR, but the possibility for the Republic to be better was always possible, more so than any other faction in the world of fallouts. Democracy at least exists, and people can vote in their interests to see change happen. Liberty at least exists under its authoritarian structure, Change can be demanded if democracy fails the people. Even the followers of the apocalypse, a bunch of anarchist socialists, believe knowledge belongs to all of the human race, seeks to bring education to everyone and share technology instead of hoarding it. They believe it's the best path forward to make the world a better place for everyone. People must change instead of clinging to the past hoping somehow it will solve the problems of the present and future. Ulysses understood this. My message is this. The destruction that has been wrought at the Divide, or elsewhere, if you can stop me, it can happen again. It will keep happening. If war doesn't change, men must change. And so must their symbols, even if it is nothing at all. Know what you follow, courier, just as I followed you to the end.